Hi, welcome back. We're looking today briefly at breathings and capital letters, sections 1.2 and 1.3 in Duff Elements of New Testament Greek. I'm on pages 14 and 15. Let's look first briefly at breathings. A breathing is a special mark which is placed on the first letter of a word if that letter is a vowel. If it's a vowel, whatever vowel it is, it has to have a breathing. And there's a great explanation there um, in Duff, you don't need me to tell you again. But just to clarify um, how you pronounce and transliterate these words, you should think of a rough breathing, which is written like that, as like a letter H at the beginning of the word. So a word like hagios, here we are. Hagios means holy. Well, you transliterate it. <laughs> Come on, Steve, learn how to spell. Hagios. Where you notice that the initial H corresponds to the rough breathing. The way that I remember which is a rough breathing and which is a smooth breathing, by the way, is that the rough breathing looks like a letter C. K -k -k. So it generates this sort of sense of, uh, you've got to make a noise, a k sound, a huh sound, yeah? So you think of the k, think of the h sound that it makes in a word like hagios. Whereas a smooth breathing in the word that we looked at yesterday, angelos, doesn't make any noise at all because it doesn't look like anything at all, at least nothing that you're familiar with from English. And so we transliterate that. Angelos, remembering of course that the Gamma Gamma transliterates as an NG, not as a GD, and it's pronounced as, a, as an NG as well, angelos. Okay, so this looks like nothing at all, makes no sound at all, that's a smooth breathing. This is rough, it looks like a K, and therefore it makes a sound like a H, and you transliterate it as an H, hagios. Tiny note on how you write breathings. If you are writing uh, a word that's a proper noun, or at the beginning of s direct speech, then that will be a capital letter at the start of the word, and there's no space above the word to write the breathing, because obviously all the capital letters, which we'll look at in a moment, occupy the full height of the line. So in that case, you must still write a breathing, but you write it just before the uh, letter, and rather than just above it. And so Duff gives the example, doesn't he, of Israel, or, um, uh, yeah, there we are, and um, bottom of section 1.3, Israel, so here goes, you write is. Ra, L. That tail is a bit long, should be shorter. Now, the way you're going to put the breathing, you have to put a breathing somewhere, or well, there's no space up here, so write it there. Okay? Don't write it there. That's wrong. Okay, so rough breathings before the letter, just before it, if it's an uppercase. Now, just then onto the subject of these uppercase letters, capital letters, uh, you're thinking, oh, a whole new alphabet to learn, because some of these letters look completely different from their lowercase counterparts. Well, uh, yeah, too bad, they just are. Um, if you're a mathematician or a physicist, some of them will be familiar, like this one, the capital letter sigma. But yeah, you do have to learn them. But a couple of things. First, they're quite rare. They're used much less often than in English. Uh, they're only used at the um, beginning of proper nouns, at the beginning of direct speech. Um, and actually, quite a lot of them look pretty similar, either to the Greek letter that they come from, or to the English equivalent. So I won't bother going through them all, but just to highlight the ones they look a bit strange and different. Um, gamma, I haven't yet found out any way to remember what that's like. You'd have to learn that. Um, the delta uh, looks like a delta of a delta winged aircraft. Think of Concorde. Well, that's actually why delta winged aircraft are called that, because they look like a Greek letter delta. Air, air, air to H, can you figure that out? Uh, air, don't know, maybe that works for you. Um, lambda, that's easy, because the lambda looks like just the bottom half of the lowercase lambda, but inflated to full size. The mu and the nu look nothing like their Greek counterparts, really. Maybe you can ca make a case for saying that the M looks a bit like that, looks a bit like an M, but I don't think so. Um, but they look exactly like the English equivalents, no problem there. This is the tricky one, Xi. But notice here, one, two, three lines in the lowercase letter, three lines in the uppercase letter. That might be, I suspect, how the letter evolved. Um, Pi, just looks like a big pie. The row, this really confuses people because it looks like an English P when it's uppercase. And if you go to Greece, you see this all the time and it confuses people, people pronounce it wrong. That you just do have, need to learn and think and think and think, don't make a mistake. Sigma, I mentioned again, looks nothing like anything at all unless you're a mathematician and you're used to writing it. That one you've just got to learn. Uh, a couple more, 
Upsilon looks like a Y, and in fact, in some older Greek uh, book, books that use transliterated Greek, you'll find uh, the Upsilon transliterated as a lowercase y as well, which is slightly frustrating. Actually, that happens sometimes in newer books as well. It's just a different system. So you do need to get used to that. Just occasionally, the Upsilon, the lowercase, is transliterated either as a u or a y, though not if it's in a diphthong. We'll look at diphthongs in the next video. You never transliterate an Upsilon as a, an English y if it's in a diphthong but sometimes you'll see it transliterated as an English Y if it's not in a diphthong. I prefer never to transliterate it as an English Y because it's just consistent, just always transliterate it like that. And finally, omega. Well, you can kind of see where this comes from because can you imagine this kind of like that, turning into that? Maybe, but that's familiar if you've ever done any electronics because it's just the symbol for an ohm, a unit of resistance. So there we are. Okay, the other case alphabet, which you need to know, but don't stress over it because it occurs relatively infrequently. And as you're going on in the coming weeks, you'll get familiar and it's not a problem. And the breathings, that's section 1.2, 1.3. So there are a couple of exercises for you to do. I suggest you do practice 1.2, it's not difficult. Um, if you like, you've got the answers at the back, so that's not a problem. And then the next video, we'll look at diphthongs and iota subscripts in section 1.4, and we'll go on from there. All right, keep working hard, 20 minutes, 30 minutes a day, five or six days a week, and we'll get you there in no time at all. All right, God bless. Leave any comments and questions below. See you next time.